great. Yeah. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about obstetrics in the emergency department. And I think whenever anybody thinks about obstetrics in the emergency department, especially if you work in an emergency department, you kind of have this reaction, right? You're just like, oh my god. What I want to go through today is really basic obstetrics. How you approach the obstetric patient in the emergency department, uh, the basics of the delivery, some of the things that can kind of go wrong, uh, some things can go very wrong, um, some basic uh, physiology, and please throw in any questions um, that are along the way. And I had a lot of stuff that I kind of wanted to do, and then as I was doing the lecture, I was like, I'm not going to be able to do all this. So um, there's a lot of stuff I didn't put in here, so if you have any questions, please throw them out. All right, so you, your first case of the day is you're in CCT. Uh, they wheel on a patient, and the nurse calls you out to triage. Can you see this patient? She's 27 years old, she's 38 weeks pregnant, and she's in uh, labor. And I think your immediate response is up to LMD. Right? <laughs> I want nothing to do with this patient. Right? And then the woman screams out, oh, it's coming. And you're like, all right. <laughs> all right. So you take a look, and you see something that looks like this. And now you're like, <laughs> you know, I, I, can we still send this patient up to l and <laughs> Like, the elevator's right there, but the answer really is probably at this point, no. And if you're at Kings County, you have an l and to send to. But you might be somewhere where the obstetrician's a half an hour away, and you are l and in the middle of the night. Or you might be someplace that doesn't even have an l and uh, unit, which means that you are responsible for delivering babies. So it's very likely <coughs> that at some point in your career, you're going to need to deliver uh, a baby. So now you've got to start getting ready to deliver this baby. And what? It's coming, right? No matter what you, do, what you say. Is winter here? Is it coming? I don't watch Game of Thrones, but I know it's coming. Or you say it's coming. <laughs> so, so what you want to do is you want to get your patient in the right positioning, and you want to get maybe a basic history. Does the patient have any prenatal care? Does she have any complications? How many weeks is she? Does she even know? Did her water break? You know, because it's possible that she's in labor and her water's never even broken, the baby's going to pop out and kind of still in, 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 the, in the amniotic sac. And that's important information that you kind of want to get if you have time. You might not have time for anything because the baby's coming, but if you do have time, you want to get the patient sitting up, um, ideally lithotomy position. We don't have a lot of beds with stirrups in CCT, but what you can do is you can pop a sheet underneath, um, underneath them or the, ups, the old upside down uh, bed pan always works and that'll kind of get them in a position. You want to have kind of supplies ready to go. You want to put your IV in because you're going to want to get labs, especially a type and screen because you don't, if you don't know the RH status, that's going to be important um, despite our Rogan conversation from last week. And, and you want to call the OB and the NICU now. Maybe not you because you probably want to catch a baby, but you want to tell somebody to get in touch if you're in a hospital with the OB in, in the house, get them down as soon as possible. You want to get peds on board. You want to get everybody on board. And that's kind of the key to everything that upsets in the emergency room. Get everybody on board right away as soon as possible. All right. So what are you, what are you going to need, right? Boiling water and sheets, that seems to be what you need. I, I actually, I didn't know the whole thing behind the boiling water, and there's actually a few answers uh, historically as to why when you watch a TV show, it's always get some boiling water. Some people said it's to get the husband to have something to do, because, you know, man is like, baby, it's blood, vaginas. <laughs> uh, and um, other people are like, you know, to clean the woman, and maybe especially if this was for um, clean water, you have clean water. I don't know what you need to boil the water for. Regardless, we're beyond that in the emergency department. Um, so this is the list of things that you need according to Tintinellis. And uh, obviously, I'm not expecting you to read the whole thing. I think the important, really important ones is scissors, Kelly clamps, at least some sort of cord clamp is ideal, but if you don't have it, any sort of clamp. Um, and the rubber suction bulb is also important. Also, obviously, you're also going to need the things to resuscitate the baby. This is really just focusing on the delivery. I guess beta 9 is always, is, is they really encourage that as well. And you're going to have to examine the patient because you might not actually see crowning. The woman might just say, it's coming. And the classic, you know, the second stage of labor, which is kind of the important part that we're talking about, is from fully dilated uh, until delivery. And for first time pregnancy, it's like 30 minutes. Um, for after that, it's uh, average is like 12. I mean, obviously everybody's different. It could be an hour, it could be four minutes, it could be 10 seconds. Um, my wife's delivery took like a minute and a half the second time. First time, not so fast. So 
it's really important to do the exam. That being said, there are caveats. If there's a lot of blood coming out, do not put your hand into the vagina. Because if there's a placenta previa, the only thing you can do is make things worse. So if there's, a, if there's blood coming out, usually in labor there's some <coughs> mucusy type stuff, but it's not going to be a lot of frank blood coming out. So frank blood coming out should really say stop before you do anything. You should really try to get an ultrasound to see if there's a placenta previa, in which case you're not going to be delivering anything that patient needs to go to the OR for a C-section. All right. Uh, the other thing is you want this to be a sterile exam, so you're going to be sterile gloves, <coughs> sterile lubricant. This isn't the time to take some um, ultrasound uh, gel and, and, and use it for your lubricant for your exam. And that's really important because you don't want this, the, there to be any infection from both the baby side or the uh, mother side. And, you know, <coughs> there's, there's dilatation and effacement and station. Not so important in the emergency department. As, if the woman's not fully dilated, you're like, I'm done, you know. We have time, hopefully, for the OB. You'll check and stuff until the OB gets to the hospital. Or if you're in some place in L and D, you're like, this patient can go up because they're not going to be delivering imminently, and I don't want any part of it. So I'm not really going to go into, you know, dilatation, which is basically how wide the cervix is, 10 centimeters, is, is fully dilated. And then effacement is the cervix flattens, um, and then there's station, which is like kind of the where the baby is relative to the ischial spine. Above the ischial spine is negative, and then it's positive. I'm not really, there's all the stages of labor that I really don't want to kind of spend time doing, although uh, we'll go through it a little bit. The reason why I have this picture up is when you do your exam, mm -hmm. it's kind of important to know, first of all, is it breech? So are you feeling body parts or buttocks, um, which is really important, or if you're feeling a head, which way the head is facing? So this is <coughs> occiput anterior. Um, or basically the head facing down, and that's kind of the standard, the safest way. That's usually what's gonna, what it's going to be. But this is, I want you to pay attention to the suture line so when you do feel it, you know exactly which way the head is facing so you can communicate and kind of plan accordingly. All right, so now we're going to actually um, watch <laughs> what happens. I, you know, I can sit here and describe it to you all day long, but are you guys ready? If you might want to put down your food. This patient has been in labor for several hours. She's probably dilated and ready to begin pushing. She holds her breath and bears down.
clear the baby's airway, nose and mouth, using a suction device. And, you know, there's no rush. You should not be pulling on that thing, waiting for it to come out. 
The indication is that the afterbirth is about to come is you'll get a gush of fluid, um, the cord will lengthen, and you might need to do some gentle traction to kind of help it come out, but you should not be pulling on it. It will pretty much come out by yourself. You should look at it to make sure it's all there, but you're not going to be the one like dealing with um, retained products if there's only a partial. You should save it. Do not throw it out. Some people say you should actually be getting cord blood at the delivery. I, I personally don't, wouldn't do that. I, I just, I'm not sitting there, really I'm just focusing on making sure that this patient gets through this delivery and the baby is okay. Don't worry about all the other stuff. You should save the placenta because it needs to be inspected to make sure it's all there. And then after the placenta is delivered, you give the Pitocin, you should do some a little bit of uterine massage, right? So you're done, right? Um, but then what happens is instead of that normal labor that we just saw, the head comes out and you're like, all right, this is happening, I'm all good, I'm all ready, you're all ready, but then the head kind of just goes back and it's like up against the perineum. Does anybody know what that is? It's a turtle sign, right? And what is that an indicator of? <coughs> Shoulder dystocia. Kind of terrifying. It's like you don't see that many deliveries, and then if you're going to get the one delivery and, and it's going to happen to be shoulder dystocia, that kind of stuff. So this is an example of the turtle sign. So you notice how the head is kind of pulled back into the, in, into the you know, it doesn't go back all the way, the idea of the turtle head going in and out. And that's the idea. So your shoulder dystocia is where the anterior shoulder is kind of stuck behind the pubic symphysis. And this can happen for a multitude of reasons. It could be a very small woman, it could be a very big baby, it could be a combination of both. Usually late, late term, um, so at 41, 42 weeks, the babies are a little bit bigger, um, and that could happen. Um, gestational diabetes, which you can have uh, macrosomia, and th those are kind of like the, the times where the shoulder dystocia can happen. But you don't really care how often it happens. If it's happening to you, it's happening to you, and you need to be prepared to deal with it um, in the emergency department. So there's all sorts of maneuvers that you can do. And there's different mnemonics to remember exactly what uh, maneuvers to do. There seems to be kind of a competing mnemonics. <laughs> Here's the alarmer mnemonic, but then there's also a helper mnemonic. So they're fairly similar in terms of the order of things. And then basically the A and the H are ask for help. The E in helper is um, evaluate for episiotomy. So don't necessarily do it, but just think about doing it. And and then they have both this leg hyperflexion. We're going to go through all these, all these. Um, and then the uh, P is, um, is uh, pressure on, on the pubic uh, symphysis pressure. And then uh, the E is kind of entering uh, the vaginal canal here. And then or, or it's like, and then all these essentially uh, anterior shoulders maneuver, root maneuver, uh, manual. These are all basically internal maneuvers that you're going to do with your hand um, from outside. And then here you have the episiotomy. Probably you should probably do the episiotomy before you do those um, internal maneuvers, honestly. Um, and then there's the Gaskin uh, maneuver, um, which is the R in both is uh, rolling more force. So, so this is the McRoberts and the supercubic pressure. This actually works 80 to 90 percent of the time. So shoulder dystocia, mm -hmm. you do the you do the, you just do both of these, and what you do is you have um, you have somebody kind of pull the legs and you flex at the hip all the way, and you're kind of like super flexed, and then you have somebody pushing pressure at the uh, super pubic pressure, not fundal pressure, because that could actually make things a lot worse. Uh, because by pushing on the frontis, you're kind of pushing the baby, you're not really helping the actual um, shoulder dystocia, but you act, can kind of push on the cord, it can, it can um, cause distress to the fetus, which is exactly what you don't want to happen. So it's really important that it's super pubic pressure, hyperflexion of the legs, and this will hopefully help deliver that anterior shoulder and the baby will come out. What if that doesn't work? So then you kind of move on to the next thing. So according to um, most of those mnemonics, the next thing would be um, kind of uh, these other internal maneuvers. According to Tintinelli, they would actually go with a Gaskin. I don't think I would. So the Gaskin is basically, this Gas Gaskin was this um, midwife who, um, who um, kind of made this procedure uh, well known. You put the woman on all fours and that kind of opens up the uh, pelvic outlet a little bit more, making it easier to, easier to deliver uh, the uh, infant. I think it's kind of hard to do if the woman's hooked up to IV, if she's sick, if she has um, epidural, which is never going to happen in the emergency department, um, it's kind of hard to do. So I would probably not be my second choice. Um, I would probably move on to the Reuben, which is most people's second choice. And, what, and this is kind of... As it's kind of complicated, these procedures, but it's actually, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So what you're going to do is you're going to put probably not your whole hand, but you can probably do two fingers, depending on, on so you're going to go behind the baby's head, and then you're just going to take the anterior shoulder, pretty much the one that's stuck, 
and you're going to move it towards his chest and so just kind of push it that way, hoping you can kind of deliver that and, and, get the, and get the baby out. The next option is the Woods uh, Screw Maneuver or Corkscrew Maneuver, and that's exactly what it sounds like. You're going to take the posterior shoulder and you're going to push it back. And essentially, these, all these maneuvers are trying to twist the baby so you can get it out. And then there's the reverse corkscrew maneuver, and you're basically just taking the shoulders and you're just kind of moving it to see if you can get if you can get the um, the fetus out. The next um, the thing, which hopefully you'll never have to do, is um, delivery of the posterior arm. So you basically you go in um, anterior uh, to the baby. So the baby's head is facing one direction. You go in anterior, and you go posterior, and you take the arm, you sweep it across the chest and you deliver that arm, hopefully giving enough space to be able to pull it out. If that doesn't work, you're in a really bad place. Um, there's other options. Um, you can break, uh, break the clavicle is kind of the next step. In, in, and, then the, and then there's you know, the Zavinelli's procedure, which is basically you take the whole head, you put it back in, and you take the patient up to the OR with your hand still inside the vagina, holding that head up there until the patient, the patient can have the emergency C-section. Shoulder dystocia is not that common, and the truth is that the first two maneuvers should work most of the time. So hopefully you never have to do it, but if you do have to do it, you should know how to do it. And then there's, you can break the pubic symphysis, or cut the pubic symphysis. Question. Yeah, so I have a question. Um, 